Um, let's begin with prayer. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that you have uh, renewed us as we've woken up this morning uh, from our slumber, uh, a little death that, uh, that then leads to resurrection. We thank you that on this, uh, at this resurrection, we come to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ here in the life of the church. We pray that you would, uh, that you would be blessed and honored by our, uh, our thoughts and our conversations and in a few uh, minutes in our worship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so once again, we're going through the anatomy of the church. That's the anatomy, not the anemone. We're, um, and so we've been done heart head. Last week, we had uh, Dr. Selby come give us the case for infant baptism. Next Sunday, we're going to have um, Mr. Fudge come and speak to us and give us the case for infant communion. And this week, being the first week of the month, we are going to meditate on the psalm that we'll be singing later on this morning, and then we'll practice singing it. So today's psalm is whoops, Psalm 126. Psalm 126. And Psalm 126, does anyone remember what kind of psalm we had last time I talked? Psalm 122. So, so yell it. Ascension. Yes, a psalm of ascents. A psalm of ascents, which we talked about. What is a psalm of ascents? Some people thought it meant you sing it really high. Some people meant that you sing it in grades or degrees. Uh, what did we come to a consensus on last week that a psalm of ascents is? Katie. You sing it as you go up to the temple. When? At one of the three feast times, probably. That's right. Exodus 34, 23. Three times in the year you shall, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God, the God of Israel. Those three main festivals were, number one, Passover. Right? They celebrate Passover. And then 49 days later, which I think is so cool, they have the Feast of Weeks. We also know it as the... Uh, the feast of uh, first fruits. Okay, so 49 days later, that's obviously when you hear 49, what do you think of? What jumps in your brain to 49? Seven to seven. Seven, seven. seven times seven, right? And so seven times seven, that's a generation of, of or I'm sorry, that's uh, 49. And what happens on the seventh seven? If you're Old Testament, well, what happens after the year of Jubilee? Jubilee, exactly. The year of Jubilee happens on the 50th year, slaves are freed, land goes back to their original owners, it's the year of Jubilee, that also, so 7 and 49 is very important, so on the 49th, after the 49th day, you, you celebrate the first fruits, Pentecost, okay, and another awesome thing about that, by the way, this is a total rabbit trail, but it's really cool, um, Matthew, at the beginning of his generations, he, he uses the number 49 as well, and he, he actually lists more people in generations than he says he does, and so you know for sure he's trying to do stuff with numbers. He, so he goes from the time of, so from the time of Abraham to the time of David, you got 14 generations, and from the time of Je David to the exile, you have 14 generations, and from the time of that to the birth of Jesus, you have 14 generations. So there you have three 14s. It's exact. Uh, so you have six sevens, and then what comes on the seventh at the seventh seven? The birth of Jesus, the year of jubilee, the captive set free, right? So, um, so anyway, 49 should you know jump out at you, um, and then in the fall, the third festival would be. Booths, the festival of booths or of tabernacles, they do this to this day. I think you go to Jerusalem, you can see they put, they build these little tabernacles and they have little, and they have palm fronds across the top or something like that. And they actually stay in them. And that's during what time? If it's in the fall, what do we do in the fall? Harvest. harvest. Okay. So in the, and in the harvest, then you give your tithe. And so they would go up to Jerusalem and build the, and you know, interestingly too, the reason why they built these booths is because during the harvest, you would have to live out in your fields. You wouldn't stay in your normal house, right? You got a bunch of stuff to gather in, right? It's all, and you're working all day, every day, you know, it's, and you, you've been planning for this for a long time and you've got to now get it all together. So you build a booth right in your field, thatched roof, little tabernacle, little place where people are supposed to dwell, right? And then you go out and you, and you gather all your stuff up. So those are the three feasts we talked about that, that, that were, these Psalms of Ascent were sung. Um... We talked about also last week, remember, the, yes, that it's like ascending the mountain. You, you, uh, you always ascend means to go up, and there is a sense in which when you go to Jerusalem, Mount Zion, right? You go up to the mountain. And when you go up and you get to the top, then you would have had, this is, as I said, Jesus in Jesus' day. This is the temple, the second temple built by Herod the Great. And, uh, and as you would triumphantly go up at these three festivals a year, 
you'd be, we talked about um, coming home a little bit, even if you live far away, which most did, um, but the sense of coming to something fami that's familiar, that you come and you recognize and you know, and even though you're, it's a home away from home, it, you ascend the mountain and you, and you worship God there because gods live on mountains, and that mountain is also kind of your home in a sense as well. Any thoughts or questions so far on that? All right, let's turn to Psalm 122, a psalm of ascents. And it's a song of ascents, it says here. And remember I said that um, when you look in your Bible at it, you see that's in caps. That's actually part of Scripture. That's, um, so let, let me read Psalm 126, and then we'll delve into it. This is like every single piece of Scripture. It's kind of cool. You can pretty much like... Go like this and like take a paragraph and start studying it and 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 it's incredible how much there is to explore in god's word and we get to do it i you know i i'm guaranteed to have a great study if, and i don't know what the psalms are in the future i mean they're on a they're on a list but you know 122 and i, and I was like okay here's 126 i'm gonna look at 126 and it's just awesome stuff so um we should be very thankful for god's word uh let me read it for us when the lord uh, restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, so a lot, a lot just came at us. So let's break it down and look at it uh, little by little. Um, hopefully, even as I read it, some things stood out to you. And then, oh man, we we're just talking about that kind of stuff in the festivals. It really makes sense that they'd sing this when they're going up to Jerusalem. Um, so first, a song of sense, we talked about that. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion. The fortunes of Zion. If you have King James, it says the captivity, which is a completely strange way to, um, to interpret that word. And so uh, almost all modern translations translate the fortune. So think about what a fortune is. What are restored fortunes? You say, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, what comes to your mind? Yeah. Uh, sometimes the temple would have been taken out of it because of paying homage to the king, uh, other kings sort of over them, or to keep them from being a war upon. We've and seen that time and time again, right, in, in our study of kings. Sometimes they could make it, and it, then they try to put things back into it, but it was sometimes not as good as it used to be. Sure. And, and sometimes it was just a, it was a great time of celebration because God actually allowed you know, his fortunes to come back in. What are fortunes? He said temple stuff. Temple stuff's made out of gold. What are fortunes? Treasures. Treasures. Riches. I would say stuff. Okay? Is it okay to be glad about stuff? I sure hope so, because we're like really, really, really spoiled right now in this time. But I think it's okay to be thankful for the stuff and to, and to pray that God returns your stuff. Um, this word... Fort, go ahead. Yeah, Mike. I don't know if you talk about Someone look that up while he talks. plunder be a part of that as well? Uh, yeah, you could, and, and a lot of times that's what happens, right? Sometimes God says, destroy everything, right? Aiken, don't take anything. And sometimes he says, go and take it all. And God, in that way, is restoring fortunes. Um, yeah, let's check. Is there any chance there's the, uh, not the financial meaning, but like kind of the future, like read your fortune type meaning the fortune? Restore the fortunes? I don't think so. I suppose that could be going in with it, but I think generally the word as they understand it is to be, is like, uh, I guess would be best translated. Let me put it this way. Providential, providential goodness. So it could have a future in that as well, I think definitely could have that overtone because it's like you know it's like the hat it's like the things that happen that we would call luck but God ordained beforehand so uh, here's some places let's look at maybe we can round out what that means and maybe as we read these there might be a future uh, nuance that could be implied so uh, does someone have Psalm 14 
have it for me? This is where that word fortunes, returning fortunes. Yes, Malia. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Okay, read it one more time. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Okay. So restoring something that was once that, that once was actually a reality. Um, salvation is linked in there too. Uh, let's can someone read for me Psalm? Oh, I think I was going to read Psalm eighty-five actually. Didn't if someone does, someone have it though already. Okay, nice and loud. Lord, you were favorable to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave the iniquity of your people. You covered all their sin. You withdrew all your wrath. You, you turned from your hot anger. Restore us again, O God of our salvation, and put away your indignation towards us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger to all generations? Will you not revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your steadfast love, O God, and grant us your salvation. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people, to his saints. But let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Steadfast love and faithfulness meet, righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs up from the ground, and righteousness looks down from the sky. Yes, the Lord will give what is good, and our land will yield its increase. Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps away. I think that whole psalm is a description, right, of restoring fortune. It starts out, Lord, restore fortune. So what kind of things... Does he mention forgiveness is part of restoration of fortunes, right? What else? Favor. What else? Peace, which is wholeness, not an absence of something else. Yield increase. Food, right? It's definitely there. Food. A withdrawal of anger. So, uh, so the, and then the one that I think is almost most telling, or at least uh, it, it is most captivating to me, is uh, Job. Job 42.10. Story of Job, you think about a story of restoration of fortune. And that's, he was super, super rich dude that had everything, right? And then he had nothing. And then, someone can someone read for me Job 42.10? And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job, when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Okay. So, a sense of restoration, particularly in Job, is not only a restoration, but an increase on top of that. The Lord restored him twofold. He started out rich, and he ended up twice as rich. And... Um, I'm not going all Joel Osteen on you, by the way. <laughs> I realize this impl the implications are, are very much spiritual as well. But I do think it's important to see that the way God works is, uh, is in giving, restoring fortune to those who are faithful to him. He owns, you people, Southern Baptist preachers say this all the time, he owns cattle on a thousand hills, right? He does. So uh, if, you, if you need to be restored, you might want to think about asking. Okay. Any thoughts on that? Request in the verse to not let them turn back to their folly, and it kind yeah. of hints at why God even removed the portions in the first place. And that's something to remember when you're asking to be restored that there's a balance between like wanting those things back, but not if they take you away from God. Yeah. And I think that there are two. Sometimes God removes. Your fortune because you need it removed because you were because you sinned, and sometimes he does it because he wants you to need him, and you may not have even done anything wrong at all, but he'll still take it away. So uh, the next thing I noticed in here is we were like those who dream. What do you think that means? We were like those who dream. You talk about dreams in scripture. I think that's I think that's spot on. That's exactly what. Think about your dreams. Do you have any dreams that you really like 
I mean, we know we have nightmares, but when you have a good dream, I mean, some of my good dreams are like, um, like that I could fly or, you know, I, but in which I know that's not money and stuff, but I have had dreams like that too, where you're just on this, you're in Hawaii enjoying this wonderful vacation and things are incredible and you just, for some reason I had never eaten in any of my dreams. That's interesting to me. But anyway, uh, I'm, but, but, but I'm, but I am enjoying my life and it's like, this is too good to be true. Yeah, it is too good to be true. Right. But I think the point is here in scripture, you know, the image that this, that the psalmist is giving is that that is what it's like when God restores his fortune. This is too good to be true. It's like winning the lottery or something. I, I, I don't know. I mean, right? Yeah, go ahead. If this was after the return from exile, could it then be about those who are dreaming in exile of where they once were and then maybe go back one day? Sure. I think so. Do we know if it's written before or after the exile? Um, I think it's probably written before the exile. But that's, it doesn't matter. There's all, it's, not, it's always written after exile. Adam gets exiled. Uh, you know, the exodus happens and there's exile. So there's, there's, it's always after exile. I mean, exile and exodus are like the theme that just keep recurring and recurring and recurring. Yes? So is the, the, the word dream talking more about like when you're sleeping at night and you're dreaming or do you, does, does it have some kind of like tone of, of like hope? Yeah, looking forward, like we're dreamers. No, I think it's, I mean, it could obviously like all, like, like words have, you know, kind of meaning domains. They don't, they don't have definitions per se. And those are in there. But I think primarily it's like when we say, man, this is too good to be true. Any other thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. So I think of uh, Jacob dreams like Jacob's ladder. Yeah. Uh, and then also um, uh, Joseph. And he dreams his brother's and that comes true as well. And in both cases, there's a, they're both in bad places yeah. uh, before those dreams are realized. Right, so dreams come to you sometimes in the midst of the re removal of, of God's fortunes to, hope, to give you hope. So uh, let's move on. Who are those who dream? Well, I think it, the very next section tells you this is what it likes to be dreaming. What? Then our mouth was filled with laughter, our tongue with shouts of joy. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Look at them. The Lord has done great things. Okay, so who are those who dream? The, and yeah, I was thinking about this just because I went to a football game last night. How often do you like laugh and shout for joy? It's not very often. I mean, something has to be really exciting. Somehow sports can do that for us. Like I'm at the football game and I'm screaming my head off like, yeah, and I'm happy and joyous and I don't care what people think around me, you know? You just couldn't do that. And people that do that about other things you think are extreme weirdos, right? But, but that kind of joy, that's what it's like for these people who dream when, you're restored, uh, when your fortunes are restored. Um, uh, and you're, they're restored. Look, look at this too. It's evangelism, right? It's, it's evangelistic. Who notices? Everybody notices. And look to capital L O R D, right? That's Yahweh. That's the Tetragrammaton. That's God's special name. Remember, I said last week, no other God, no other being, no other person has that name. When you hear that name, it's unfortunate that we use Lord, honestly, because you don't get that. The, the nations, these nations are all saying, Yahweh has done great things, right? Not Baal has done great things. Not just any god, not Asherah, right? Um, Yahweh has done great things, and then notice as well. Then the the uh, the affirmation: Yes, the Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Yeah. Well, just going back to the thing about fortune, it seems like it can't just be material fortune, right? Because of this, because sure. because Israel is not the only nation that can be prosperous. You know, like, right. it wouldn't be so, like, if the nation becomes really rich, it's not so great. I mean, that's impressive, but it's not, you know, right. not so great. It's, it sounds like it's also, you know, uh, I, I mean, probably the thing that nation, the thing that nations tend to envy other nations about is, like, their peace and their, and their ability to live in harmony together and uh, might flourish. Absolutely. And I think uh, that um, Elizabeth pointed out that peace was one of those things that stood out. Peace is, peace Peace is something that I think we use the word so much that it, we don't realize the value that it has. Yeah. 
And um, yep, yeah, she. Building on that, um, the, the time in Israel's history when the nation's most marveled at Israel seems to be like when David was on the throne. Uh, maybe Solomon afterwards, right? And they're, they're a big power, and yeah. it's lots of material, but it's more than that, right? They're doing great things. So. Yeah, they're blessing the world, too, especially like Solomon, right? People coming in, taking things back, even scripture. Yeah, I think um, peace and authority, maybe, right? When, at the end of the day, it's all about authority, right? And you want, and, and the, the most important thing you could have is a prince of peace. Yeah. Um, and that's, that hits us right now, even like, you know, North Korea, you just can't really get it out of the back of your mind, you know, because uh, there's no peace. Yeah, you, Chrissy, you were going to say something? Well, I think part of the difference to Andrew with the fortunes isn't necessarily the things themselves, but how they're acquired. Like the way that God moves and rescues his people is unique apart from how other people acquire those materials. Yes, yeah. And it is cool too if you look, like, I think even in, in the Babylonian exile, remember, God says, You're not in exile in Jeremiah. He says, Build houses and live in them. You know, get, have kids. Uh, you walk around the streets, pray for the peace of the city. Have vineyards and plant and grow and enjoy your wine and your food. Um, in a sense that he's saying in the midst of where you think you are destitute, I am restoring your fortunes so that you can then be a light to the Gentiles. Um, and they can say, Yahweh has done great things for them. Um, so they're hand in hand almost, right? The fact that you are at peace in the city means you can enjoy bread and wine. Um, Exodus 15, 11 through 18. Can someone read that for me? Maybe just some sword drills. <laughs> it's the danger of, of, digital, of the digital world, right? Because I almost always, I brought it this morning, um, but I almost always just use my ESV app on my phone. But thank goodness I grew up in a fundamentalist school where it was like we had to do soldiers all day, every day. Yeah, go ahead. Who is like you among the gods of the Lord? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in praises, working wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. In your loving kindness, you have led the people who you have redeemed. In your strength, you have guided them to your holy habitation. The peoples have heard, they tremble. Anguish has gripped the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom were dismayed. The leaders of Moab trebly grips them. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them. By the greatness of your arm, they are motionless as stone. Until your people pass over, O Lord, until the people pass over whom you have purchased. Will bring them and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign forever. So we see this is part of that song uh, after the after the uh, parting of the Red Sea and then the destruction of Pharaoh, and you see all the even the nations of Philistia, even all the nations of Canaan, they all say what Yahweh has done great things. That's that's uh, part of what it means to have your portions restored. Any thoughts on that? And notice it's Yah there's Yahweh always when you see L O R D. You have you have on the mouths of people who are the enemies of God a confession that God is great. Moving on, restore. Okay, so the first three verses we saw is all about you have you've done this you were glad. Then we get here to verse 4. It looks it's like a separate stanza. And it says, Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the streams of Negev. What does that tell us? It's striking to me. Maybe. It's like the now, but not yet. It could be a now, not yet. So part of it is it's been restored and we need it restored more, or we, or we know we still lack something. The other thing is, I think, right, the Psalms always point out to us peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys, right? So they can say, thanks, God, you restored our fortune. And then we realize they've lost it again. Right? And so what do they do? They ask for it. They ask for it. That's what we got. That's got to be our lives. 
you thank him and you say, can, can you do that again, God? Because I need you. Because I, I'm, I don't have my fortunes. I don't have rest. I don't have peace. You need to beg for it. And, and I love the imagery, too, of the, like the streams of the Negev. Anyone know what the Negev is? Valley of Negev. It, here's, uh, oh, shoot. Oh, okay. Yeah. History has its ups and downs. I just said that, right? <laughs> How does God restore our fortunes? Like the streams in the Negev. Think about the streams in Negev. Okay, so I'm going to tell you it's a desert. I have a picture I want to show you, too, some cool things. But first, I want you to think about this. When, when it says restore like the streams of Negev, it's a desert. What's the only way you're going to get streams? Rain. What do we do to make rain? Nothing. We can't do anything. Yeah, we can pray. Yes, you're right. Amen. We do this, right? That's true. But besides that, we all we can do is ask for it, and God gets to do it when he wants. It's sudden, right? The rains come down, and all of a sudden, we know this in Santa Clarita. We have rivers all over the place, right? It's just where homeless people live. Um, but the rains come, and a rushing stream of water comes, and then what comes up? Blessings, stuff, seeds that have been dormant for a, for a long time, all of a sudden rise. It's sudden, and it's an act of God alone. So, for example, here is Negev, and you can see there's like the Santa Clarita River, right? There's a little bit of green there, right? There's some oak trees in our thing because they've got deep enough roots and all that. Um, but there, this is the land. This is the Negev. Except, except every once in a while, why would they say like the streams of Negev? God causes it to rain, rains, 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 and boom. That's the Negev. Right? We know this. This is like the something, you know, the poppy festival. We go out to the desert to see it. But it's awesome. That's that is the way that God uh, restores. This is the way that God um, answers prayer. And so we shouldn't expect just because you live in a desert that there aren't going to be flowers. We just know that it's sudden and that it's done by God alone. Let's move on. Those who sow in tears shall reap shouts of joy. Those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. So the first image we had was of the desert and God alone. The second is what? Farming. That is something we do, right? That is something we do. We farm. We don't make them grow, but we at least put them where they're supposed to put them, right? And how is, he, how is this person sowing? In tears. Why? Why would someone be sowing in tears? There's poverty, right? There's loss, yes, too. But, when you're, but in, in the midst of sowing... You're sowing because you're sorry, I think. I mean, part of it is like, because you have nothing. This isn't someone who has a huge storehouse of stuff. This is someone who's hoping, who's planting, and, and it's, it's all they got left. They're at the end. And, uh, and they, they sow in tears, but they reap in shouts of joy. Why do they shout for joy? They get a ton of grain. He who goes out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves in, right? Bringing in the in-gathering. And again, remember those festivals. Remember what's going on in all of those festivals. So even if you sow in sorrow, you know that you'll reap uh, with plenty. Think about that. So look at this death and resurrection image. And it's not just, I'm not just, we're not just reading that in there. It's right there, right? When you sow, you sow, you sow a seed that, that goes into the ground, right? What goes into the ground dead things, and then what comes up? Living things, okay? They know this. They're in sorrow because they're dead. They're in joy because there's resurrection, okay? Um, psalm 30. Psalm 30 is my favorite psalm, but this, uh, you should probably, I bet in your minds, even when you heard sorrow and joy, you thought, oh, you've turned my mourning into dancing. I remember that. You know, it's, I, I, so can someone read for me Psalm 30, verse 5? For his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is for a lifetime. 
Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy comes with the morning. So there we go again. So you have death and resurrection, always tied there, right, with night and day, right? Go sleep is a little good death. That you revive, you're different, you're resurrected in the morning. Uh, uh, gr ground, in the ground is a grave, is death. Coming up is resurrection, descending and ascending, all of these things. And also, I, that was interesting, I didn't notice before, but the anger that we saw in the 85 is contrasted there as well. His anger is for a moment, his favor is for a lifetime. He, re he takes away your fortunes for a moment, but he restores you twice fold like J Job, right? Um, that entire psalm, though, is it talks about, um, you know, you did not let me go down into the pit. You raised me up, you set my mountain of strength, and I was joyful. You hid your face, I became terrified, right? Hid your face, he falls to the bottom and says, will the dust sing of your praises? Will it? He cries out to God, he wrestles with God. What can you do? Yes, you can pray. And God hears, and you've turned my morning into dancing. You've removed my sackcloth and you've replaced it so that I might, my, my praise might sing your praise forever. Um, so death and resurrection is definitely here. 1 Corinthians 15.40. Someone read that for me. Okay, go ahead. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. I may have read the wrong one, yeah. I was trying to talk talk about it is sown an uh, earthly body and is raised a physical body. So I do know it is 43. 42. 42. So is it with the resurrection? So is it with the resurrection of the dead? What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual. Thus it is written: the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Okay. So you see, all of those things then are the same, are analogous. I think too, in some ways. Removal of fortune, restoring of fortune. Notice too, it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. That does not mean it's not physical. Jesus is raised, he's the first fruits, a spiritual body, and, he's, and, he, and the first thing he does is eats. So don't think, we always have to be aware of this Gnostic tendency to say, really, uh, the, the visible is the unimportant and the invisible is the really important um, or the non-material. Yes? That is annoying too because actually when it says natural, it's sukhikon, which means like right. soulish. Right. So it's, actually, it's not even... Yeah. Even the natural is, yeah, is, is something that we might yeah. think is spiritual. Yeah. So, so it's not comparing like bodies, bodies right. to or material to material. Right. No, no. It's, it's basically the two things that we've been looking at. Death, no death. Able to die, imperishable. Uh, in the grave, out of the grave. Nighttime, daytime. You, yeah. uh, John 12, 23, too. Even Jesus, then, um, has something to, to say to us regarding this psalm. Go ahead, Maggie. Do not worry. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens, they do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Okay, actually, I think that's the wrong uh, gospel, but that had a lot that that applied as well. That was either Matthew or Luke. Um, so, um, yeah, oh, I'll read. I'll just read it. I have it here. Um, but thank you. It, it actually it actually did apply. Uh, Twenty three says this. And Jesus answered them, "The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies." It remains alone, but if 
it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. That's exactly what we're talking about here with the restoration of fortune. Any thoughts on that? That I was having for Christ, the God man himself, he had to sow in tears and then reap in joy. And is it <coughs> where it says that he was able to endure the cross because of the joy set before him? Yeah. Like, he, the only way we can sow in tears and, and physically act out that in obedience, because God's calling us to do something not in accordance with what we see in our mind or perceive or even seem good and right at the time is because you're claiming that something after this is going to be better than what I'm experiencing right now. Right. Which is very contrary to how we act in our modern culture. Yeah. And one of the most comforting verses for me too, you know, um, this light and momentary affliction is achieving for us an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all, right? Uh, so the sorrow, even Jesus' sorrow in comparison to the joy that's set before him is far outweighs. It's weighty, right? Yes? Do you think there's any indication that the tears are somehow watering the seeds? Or sure. that, I don't know, it's like maybe there's like a, a weird baptism thing where sure. it's death and then water comes and then the thing stops life and he's joyful? Yes, you're a natural early church father, <laughs> right? It's good stuff. I believe that stuff too. I love it. I love it. Um, I think that's all implied in there and it's true. You're, you're sowing seeds and you're water and you're crying over them and the tears bring forth. You water, water the seed and bring forth new life. Jesus, you know, he, he cries and he, and he prays in the garden of Gethsemane. He's in a garden too and he's, you know, watering. So, yeah, it's cool. Uh, I think the sorrow somehow provides or does that mean, does that have implication for what sorrow is and how if it has some sort of power or is part of, like part of something? Well, I would say this, sorrow is necessary. Sorrow is essential to life. Part of the reason people have such a hard time, I think, is because they thought it was supposed to be better all the time. And it is better, but it can be better and sorrowful at the same time. Right? We can't get there without the sorrow. You need it. You needed the sorrow maybe to water, to water it. So, yeah. Maybe with that, um, Jesus and Lazarus, you know? Mm -hmm. the Jesus wept. And then the shots of joy of his resurrection. That's cool. That's cool. Did you hear that? Lazarus is there, and what? Jesus has to cry first. He has to, he has to, he has to sow in, in sadness. And then he, and then he says, Lazarus, come! And there he comes. And there's a lot of sense that passage is like a passage, like, really emphasizes what Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do. And it stopped. <laughs> Jesus wept. Yeah. Yeah, and it's like it's always like what, it's a weird hiatus in the text, yeah. like where Jesus weeps, and we're like, oh, he's so nice, you know. But maybe there's something yeah. deeper. Yeah. Uh, his his sorrow lasted for a moment, and his and his favor lasted for a lifetime. Yeah. Um, we're I I'm hitting it, coming up on. I wish we could talk more. Just one more thing I wanted to uh, point out that um, none of this is mine, by the way. I re, I beg, borrow, and steal from basically everything I say is from like. Jim Jordan, Peter Lightheart, N.T. Wright, and a few others. Um, so don't don't say Mr. Person noticed something cool. No, I didn't. I read it or I heard it. Uh, Restore the fortunes of the Lord like the streams in Negev. You see that water, right? The streams out. That's the Holy Spirit, right? That's baptism. We said that. You have the here. The only way it comes is suddenly and from God alone. Think of Pentecost, right? And the Holy Spirit's poured out, and I will pour out my Holy Spirit. Right? The Holy Spirit brings, restores the fortunes. Then, like we've just been talking about this whole time, Jesus obviously is the one who sheds the tears, who sows tears, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies. Right? So this is, we have Jesus here. And then, when he does that, he was going to do what at the end? Jesus sows he cries, and then what does he do? Brings in sheaves. What's that? 
the church, right? Jesus is the one. It's always all about Jesus. But Jesus is the one who then, his favor lasts for a lifetime. And what that is, is that brings, that's bringing the whole world in. So, any final thoughts on that? Okay, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to start, we're going to sing this psalm. Okay? Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for these psalms of ascents. I thank you that every single part of your scripture is so uh, awesome. And I pray that we would be encouraged today. Uh, and I think I pray that we'd be encouraged in moments where we have a lot to give thanks and where we have a little uh, to, um, to sow, to continue sowing, knowing that you'll bring in a harvest. In Jesus' name, amen.